Hi there, my name is Ben Ziegler and I'm a sophomore at Hamilton College presenting my semester long research on the rise and fall of the Robert E. Lee Monument in New Orleans. From the fanfare of musical instruments to the rustling of beads, Mardi Gras has been an integral part of New Orleans since the 1800s. The streets are lined with vibrant colors and many people would on a special Mardi Gras mask or enjoy King's cake. In 2016, for example, there's over 10 million visitors and the large influx of these visitors meant $164 billion for the city. However, every year from 1884 to 2017, the Mardi Gras parade would pass by the Robert E. Lee Monument and the Confederate memorialization that it represented. The monument celebrated a man that had no relation to the city of New Orleans and would ultimately betray the United States. And despite this, Lee was, there was a large scale anger when the statue would ultimately come down on May 19th, 2017. In the wake of defeat, an alternative narrative came to fruition the lost cause. The Confederacy tried to defend their cause and attribute the overwhelming loss to more manpower and resources by the Union. The Robert Lee Monument Association was formed just 35 days after Lee's death and would ultimately be presented on February 22nd, 1884. And the date is very important because it happens to be George Washington's birthday. The Robert E. Lee Monument Association nods an ode to the connection between between the two men and the Confederacy would continuously try and use this to connect Lee and Washington and overall the Confederates rebellion to the American Revolution. Lee and Washington did have some connections. Lee's father, Light Horse Harry, served under Washington in the Revolutionary War and Lee would marry Mary Custis, the step-great granddaughter of Washington. Lee was viewed as a hero of the South and which ultimately would spur the, des spur the desire to create this monument. Some of the earliest members included Louisiana Supreme Court Justice Charles E. Fenner and Confederate veteran J.T. Beauregard. The Robert E. Lee Monument, Monument Association was on the forefront of its time when it was created in the heart of construction, and the board was composed entirely of men, which might not seem surprising was unique at the time where many of the organizations were led by women, such as the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The Robert Lee Monument Association would need to raise $36,400 for the monument. To raise these funds, the association would frequently advertise in newspapers, like here in the Vegas Ball, and other times such as hosting musical performances and even had a subscription service. However, after the Civil War, New Orleans, like much of the rest of the South, was in economic downfall and made funding this statue very difficult. And in May of 1876, the project nearly went under. However, it survived. And on February 22nd, 1884, there was approximately 15,000 people in attendance, including former, former Confederate President Jefferson Davis and two of General Lee's daughters. The commemoration of Lee's statue demonstrated a moment of white unity and presented an opportunity for the reconciliation of white Americans as veterans from both sides of the war gathered to pay homage to the man that they held in high reverence. The Lee's monument would rest in the heart of New Orleans and the prominent location would help foster the lost cause culture. The United Dawes of the Confederacy played a really important role. They would host birthday parties for Lee and would bring thousands of local elementary kids to learn about Lee and his heroism. In the 1930s, the city of New Orleans took over the maintenance of the statue and the Louisiana Workers' Progress Administration declared the monument as the finest statue generally in the United States. 20 years later, in 1953, the statue was temporarily removed to undergo repairs, which received a mixed reaction. However, this was the first time there was criticism of the monument, where one local citizen wrote an editorial declaring that the statue needed to be removed permanently, and it would mean progress for the city, and that the New Orleans should not live in the South in the lost cause. However, it's important to note that then Mayor Chet Morrison noted that the Confederate General could fall into parade goaders during Carnival at any given moment. However, the theme of criticism when the monument went under renov renovation was continuous. And the next time it would go under renovation in 1997, Malcolm Suver and three other African-American men would cr criticize the monument as a pro-slavery icon in a city mostly populated by the descendants of African-Americans and led by a Mac Black mayor, super criticized Lee and dispelled the lost cause. Everyone knows that the so-called argument of fighting for states' rights was in fact and always has been and continues to be 
an argument for white supremacy and African-American oppression. He added, would anyone object if Jew Jewish people would announce or protest the statue of Adolf Hitler or any of his Nazi generals? However, the conversation would not continue until 2015 when, my goodness, Dylan Roof killed nine African-Americans at the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston. And eight days later, Mitch, Mayor Mitch Landrieu declared that he planned to remove the statue and other Confederate relics of the city. Despite this, he was inspired before then by the man next to him, Wynton Marcellus, who was a musician that in 2014 raised the question why the monument needed to come down. The two men would get to work and later on December 15th, 2015, the New Orleans City Council ultimately voted six to one to remove it. However, they had faced large scale opposition from then Governor Bobby Jindal, and there was a petition that garnered over 6,000 signatures to not spend a dime in the city until Mitchell and Greer agreed to not remove the monument. Further anger included the burning of the contractor in charge of removing its Lamborghini, which was valued over $200,000. There was lawsuits, and on May, March 6, 2017, the U.S. Fifth Court of Appeals ultimately ruled that the monument could legally be taken down, and on May 19, 2017, it did. However, there was many that dis disagreed and wanted to fight to preserve their cultures, and the original Rodabilly Monument Association of 1870 would be reincarnated re in 2017 to preserve the monument, to protect history. But in reality, this is a code term for white supremacy. The void left behind by Robert Lee Monument had to be rectified. And in 2022, Simone's Lay sculpture representing Mamiwata was installed. The statue represented a water deity in spirit who recurs across multiple African diaspora communities. Lay's statue is slated to remain until the middle of July, 2022. However, it's a lot more important than that. The reclamation of this space is integral to fighting the white supremacy and necessary to spell the lost cause for mainstream conversations in public places and celebrate New Orleans as a cosmopolitan city. I'd like to thank Professor Sigley, my parents, and everyone else in supporting me in this project. And had a blast learning more about this and dispelling the lost cause. Thank you.